Telemedicine is one of the hottest topics in health in 2020 with explosive implementation since the beginning of the year and lots of questions now about the future of telemedicine. Let's dig deeper on where telemedicine is going moving forward. Today, we're joined by Dr. Michael Grywe, an orthopedic surgeon in the Cincinnati area, and more relevantly, the founder of two telemedicine platforms, Ortho Live and Spring Health Live. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much, Keith. Glad to be here. Should be a fascinating discussion, and the the telemedicine sector has been in a whirlwind since January, and you've been riding it the whole way. Have you had a chance to catch your breath yet? Oh, it has been insane. It's been it has absolutely been a whirlwind roller coaster. It's been a lot of fun, um, you know. But uh, we have been we have uh, sort of gotten to a point now where we're uh, we're still continuing to grow, but it wasn't as crazy. It's not as crazy now as it was in March or April. Um, that was when things really were at their peak. Yeah. So I want people who are watching this interview to understand the difference between the Ortho Live platform and the Spring Health Live platform, just so they have a little perspective. Absolutely. So Ortho Live is specific to kind of orthopedics and musculoskeletal health. So we really focus on um, things like, you know, physical therapy, athletic trainers, orthopedic surgeons, um, bracing, you know, things like that. That's how the the Ortho Live platform functions, and um, you know, it's kind of what we did first. We we wanted to sort of perfect it in an area that I knew best, and that's really where Ortho Live came in. I'm an orthopedic surgeon by trade, and so that's kind of how we got started. And then we realized that that platform was really well suited for other specialties too, and so that's where Spring Health Live came in. And now Spring Health Live serves pretty much every other sector of medicine. Um, you know, we're, we're focusing in on different areas that kind of need telemedicine the most at this point in time, but it can really be used by almost anyone. Um, so it's, it's great. I, those two platforms have been, uh, been fun and we're, we're, uh, we're doing great with both of them. Fantastic. And I want people to understand because it would be easy to underestimate or just not see the genuine explosion in adoption of telemedicine by both medical practices and patients who found it pretty easy to use after they did it once, just since January. No question. I think what has been you know most amazing to see is that there was a little bit of pushback, you know, pre-January, mm -hmm. and we were still growing as a company and seeing a lot of adoption. But to the extent that COVID has been really rough on society, it has helped telemedicine adoption tremendously. And so you've seen this gigantic rise in telemedicine visits. And I think we're going to top over 100 million visits this year, where wow. I think we were at 20 million last year, and maybe even higher than that. So there really has been an absolute explosion. And most people are reporting a tenfold increase in the number of uh, telemedicine visits that are being performed. So it is really, really incredible. Absolutely amazing. And there's no doubt that telemedicine is here to stay in the future. Why do you believe that doctors' practices must offer it as part of their offerings to remain competitive in the future? Yeah, I think that is literally it. I mean, to stay relevant, you have to offer telemedicine to patients. Patients right now are expecting telemedicine. And so they, they want to be able to be offered that. It's a lot more convenient for them they know it's feasible. They know it's possible. In order to stay relevant in today's healthcare landscape, you have to be able to offer something from a telemedicine perspective. You have to be able to offer online visits. It's very critical for patients and for making sure that you stay at the cutting edge uh, for patients and what they expect out of their physicians. So let's look at a couple of issues, sort of bureaucratic industry government issues about the future of telemedicine going forward. One of the big questions is to what extent are insurance companies going to reimburse doctors who do telemedicine visits? And some of that seems to be up in the air still. Yeah, I think it is. But I mean, Keith, if you look at the way and the trend that was happening pre-COVID, Mm -hmm. There were about 30 plus states that had what we call parity laws. That means that patients were getting uh, in to see their doctor and whether they're doing it in the office or they were doing it via telemedicine, they were getting reimbursed the exact same amount. So even pre-COVID, we had the vast majority of states commercial insurance wise 
being reimbursed, uh, those physicians were getting reimbursed in an equal way. And now what I don't think is going to happen, I don't think we're going to go back. I think we're going to continue to grow. I think we're going to see that growth continue to happen. And I don't anticipate going in a, uh, in a different direction with it. I think it's just going to continue to, uh, and, and we'll see that reimbursement happen. And it'll be interesting because if the users, if the patients say, hey, we really want this, it's affordable, it's accessible, and it's safe. I don't have to go out during the pandemic and be exposed. Uh, do you feel like patients need to do some advocacy to make sure that gets pushed through? Yeah, without a doubt. And I especially think Medicare is the one area because Medicare typically dictates sort of what happens across the insurance landscape. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the sad things was pre-COVID, patients who were on Medicare could not be seen in sort of an urban environment via mm -hmm. telemedicine. If they were in a rural environment, they could be. But now everything's changed so that Medicare recipients can be seen no matter where they are. And I, I hope um, for the sake of our Medicare population that that does not get reversed. And I think it's important and it's incumbent on patients everywhere to send letters to their, their lawmakers, the legislatures, uh, to, to make sure that that does occur. I, I agree with you 100 percent, Keith. And that's a great point. Seema Verma is the Trump administration's point person on Medicare. And she recently made public statements saying that, in her opinion, it has to go forward. The added access to Medicare during the pandemic must remain in place in the future because she believes it's not in the best interest for all Medicare patients, or some of them at least, to have to go to in office visits. She sees the benefit of having some of them get the telemedicine visits. So that's the point person at the Trump administration speaking out on that. Yeah, I think that really says all, all I needed to hear is, you know, when I heard that come out, I think it was last week sometime, I really felt like, you know, we're on the right track here. We have our, our leadership understanding how important it is, not only for the convenience of the patient, but now for the safety of the patients as well. And so I really feel like it's, it's a smart move by the leadership to make sure that that continues to, to be pushed forward. And I don't really see things going back uh, the way that they, they were. You know, I think we're going to continue to see this telehealth pendulum continue to swing in the right direction. Interesting. Let me give just a little more context. Uh, the, uh, the government administrators of Medicare, which we refer to as CMS, during the pandemic have made the standards easier for Medicare to reimburse the doctors that do these telehealth visits for Medicare patients. And so that's sort of the, the overlying issue here is where does that go in the future? And this is a big deal for the future of telemedicine. No question. No question. I mean, the fact that physicians can get reimbursed from Medicare for telemedicine visits anywhere in the United States is a really critical thing to help push telemedicine forward because physicians are not going to do something that they don't get reimbursed for in most cases. I mean, there's extenuating circumstances uh, where we, we do the best that we can when we need to. But, you know, in general, if you want something to continue to be successful, you need to make sure that it gets reimbursed. And that's exactly what's happened here. Dr. Grabby, one last question for you on the future of telemedicine. And it's the issue of doctors practicing telemedicine across state lines, which I believe they can now during the pandemic. And it'll be interesting to see if you can put that genie back in the bottle or not. Well, that's a good question. That is the one where I'm not sure what's going to happen. I am not sure whether or not we're going to be allowed to practice across state lines. Mm -hmm. But I, I still think, I think that potentially th there's been such a great ability for us to reach portions of the population that may be in a you know, poor service area, they don't have physicians close by, it's important for us to be able to reach them. And if someone's not in their state offering telemedicine, you know, it could be ha happening from another state. So I think it's a reasonable uh, thing to continue to allow. And so we'll see what happens with that.